we start, I'd first like to thank the Regional Plan Association and the Rudin Center for Transportation and Policy and Management for partnering with us on this event and other important infrastructure issues. And thank you to the New York leadership who have joined us this morning, the, the Gateway Program Development Corporation trustees, Tony Kosha and Jerry Zaro. Morning. Uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey board members, George McDonald and Leisha Eve. Uh, MTA leadership, Ronnie Hakeem, J Jano Lieber, and Midori, Midori Valdivia, and Taxi and Limousine Commissioner, Amir Joshi. So thank you all for coming. Um, the current status of our railway tunnels that bring visitors and commuters into our city are in a critical state, and their continued de deterioration could be catastrophic. The Regional Plan Association rang the bell on this issue last week with a new report that found that the unexpected loss of just one of the existing train tunnels could cut train traffic into Manhattan by about 75 percent. As fewer folks come into the city for work or waste away on the commute, the national economy would take a hit of 16 billion dollars over four years. It's an issue we can no longer ignore, and we're glad that Senator Schumer, who has been a consistent voice and a strong advocate down in Washington, D.C., for the repair of this critical infrastructure, is here with us this morning. Before the Senator speaks, I'd like to first introduce Tom Wright to speak in more detail about their recent report. Tom has been the president and CEO of the Regional Plan Association since 2015, leading the production of RPA's landmark fourth regional plan and providing research, planning, and advocacy to make the region more affordable, livable, modern, resilient, and sustainable. Tom? Thank you, Angela. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm going to be very brief, but I want to kind of give an overview of the report that we released. Um, last week, a preventable crisis. First, I should thank uh, ABNY, the Rudin Center. I also want to particularly thank Arup, which did a lot of the consulting work for us on the modeling on this and other consultants who helped. Tony Shores, a board member at RPA who really helped drive this work, and Chris Jones, our senior VP for research who oversaw it, and in particular our partners at NJ Transit, Amtrak, the Port Authority, and the MTA. This study came about because a couple years ago, as I think everyone here knows, Superstorm Sandy flooded the Hudson River tunnels. And we started to see a, a project which before that had been called access to the region's core to double capacity under the Hudson River, then became essentially a project to try and save capacity under the Hudson River. Four years ago at the RPA assembly, which we have every spring, and it's April 19th for those of you, I hope you'll join us, we did in the morning a polling where we got up in front of a thousand people, like the audience this morning, folks working in economic development and transportation, and asked them, what did they think was going to happen first? We were going to either build the Gateway Project or lose capacity under the Hudson River. 89% of the respondents said that they thought it was more likely we were going to lose capacity. Um, I then turned to Chairman Tony Kosha, the chairman of Amtrak, who was on the stage, and asked Tony what he thought of that response. And Tony, characteristically blunt, said, I wonder what the 11% are thinking. So for four years, we've been wondering at RPA, and I think all of you have been wondering, what will happen if we get to that moment when Amtrak decides that they need to shut the tunnels to make repairs? And so we did an analysis to answer that question. What would be a scenario that's likely to happen under which Amtrak decides that they need to take one of the tunnels out, make repairs, and do the next one? And so we decided to do this analysis. And here's what we got. The numbers are staggering. Over $16 billion in lost economic activity, mostly in lost wages, because people will take longer and it'll be much harder for them to get to work, but also goods movement, travel between Washington and New York City, and even health and safety would get much worse. And so these are the costs to the region that we calculated from this scenario of a planned shutdown. We came up with this number by doing really extensive modeling work and saying, what will specifically happen? There are 67,000 people using those, those lines during the peak hours of the weekday today. So we did an analysis of what happens if we see that 75% reduction. Well, we thought that still about 29,000 people could still get across the Hudson River by the tunnel, but some 38,000 people would need to find a new way to get between New York and New Jersey on a daily basis. We estimated that about a third of them could take the PATH system, but those of you who've ridden the PATH lately know there isn't a lot of extra room on that, but we thought about a third of them could take the PATH, 
and then about 5,000 and 4,000 on buses and ferries. Again, not a lot to give there. And another 11,000 people would have to drive. About half of those people would probably have to buy a car just to make this trip. And some 4,000 people would give up altogether and not be able to make that trip. The thing is, it's not just about those 38,000 people. In a transportation network as stressed and strained as ours, there are ripple effects, there are cascading effects across the entire system. 170,000 people rely on the path and the buses today. They would suddenly see their commutes become measurably worse because of the extra people crowding on. And drivers, a quarter of a million people who drive to work every day, half of them not even coming to Manhattan, would see their, their commutes worsen. Over 100,000 of them would, would spend more than an hour a day commuting because of that 11,000 people who are pushed onto the system. Then over a half a million people would be impacted, homeowners, taxpayers. We would see delivery of over a billion dollars extra cost in freight, in freight. Travelers between New York and Washington, D.C., because most people will try to fly, we estimated that the cost of a flight would increase from 65 to over 100 percent to fly between New York and Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, state and local tax revenues would be driven down by, we estimated, $7 billion. Some of that federal, you can actually trace these, these effects all the way down to Virginia and, and state property taxes and state taxes reduced there. Meanwhile, because of the additional drivers on the road, we estimate an additional 38,000 car crashes and accidents. That's roughly one an hour over four years, including up to 100 people losing their lives because of the additional travel required by this. And then finally, what we looked at was kind of property values, because we know that people's access to the jobs in New York is what drives their property values. 40% of residential property value in northern New Jersey is within two miles of a train station. And those values would plummet. In Westchester and the Hudson Valley, we would see those values go down. And we estimated that that would cost $22 billion in lost value to residential homes. I want to close here to say that as we did this analysis, we considered this a best case scenario. This is under a planned closure, not, not an emergency closure. There were other estimates and other costs that we were not able to, to assess. I talked about residential property values. There's over $200 billion worth of commercial property value in Manhattan that would also be at risk, but we didn't have a way of assessing that, so we didn't count that. I talked about over $9 billion in lost wages. That's only from the direct travel times that we could see, but as people know, as your travel becomes less predictable, you, had to have, you have to add buffers into your travel times. We didn't estimate any of that. Um, so, so again, we considered these numbers, $16 billion in lost economic activity, $22 billion in reduced property values, $7 billion in lost tax revenues, to really be a floor, not a ceiling, under what this, this region would face and the entire Northeast would face um, if we get a closure uh, of the tunnels for this scenario. So it is now my pleasure to introduce somebody who needs no introduction to this group. He's available for all of us um, all the time, and all New Yorkers, I think, know our Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer. Chuck, we welcome you to the podium to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for that great presentation, which shows the urgency of what we're talking about in so many different ways. Um, and I want to thank uh, not only Tom, but Angela and Abney, and all those who make Abney, the, continue to make Abney the great organization that it is, and uh, everyone else for coming. Uh, I always start by telling a story. I'm going to make a very short one, because i got to leave fairly quickly here. Um, so I'm wearing a green tie because it's St. Patrick's Week. I marched in the Binghamton St. Patrick's Day Parade on Saturday, which kicks off the season. So this is a story as a tribute to New York ecumenicalism, diversity, and getting along. They introduced Yogi Berra to a man named Sir Ben Briscoe. And they said, Yogi, this is Sir Ben Briscoe. He's the Lord High Mayor of Dublin. 
In the 450 years we've had Lord High Mayors of Dublin, he's the first one who's Jewish. Yogi put his arm around his shoulder, looked him in the eye and said, only in America. <laughs> I also want to just give a shout out to some of my colleagues who have worked with me. As you know, Gateway has been a passion of mine. But I want to thank my colleague in New York, Senator Gillibrand, and my two colleagues across the river, Senators Menendez and Booker, as well as Governor Murphy, who's made this a very high priority, um, as has Governor Cuomo. So we're all working together, the New York and New Jersey delegations, on this issue and have been steadfast leaders. Now, whenever my fellow senators ask me why, in the heat of budget negotiations, that I take Gateway so seriously, I like to tell them about a story about one of the greatest mentors anyone can ever have, and he was a great mentor to me, and that is Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Moynihan grew up in Hell's Kitchen in the 30s. It was still crowded with tenements, and many Irish immigrant families lived there. And as the story goes, Hell's Kitchen got its name when a veteran policeman named Dutch Fred stumbled on a street riot with his rookie partner at 39th Street and 10th Avenue. The rookie, shocked by the utter violence and depravity of what he saw, said, this place is hell itself. To which Dutch Fred coolly replied, kid, hell's a mild climate. This is hell's kitchen. But when Senator Moynihan was attending the Church of St. Raphael in Hell's Kitchen as a young boy, right near the very intersection where Dutch Fred and his rookie partner witnessed the lowest depths of humanity, he didn't realize that his neighborhood was on the edge of a vast transformation. When Moynihan was just five years old, the 8th Avenue subway line opened from Chambers to 207th Street, connecting the west side to the rest of the city overnight. When he was 10 years old, the elevated West Side Highway and Henry Hudson Parkway were completed. The Lincoln Tunnel opened, greatly facilitating the movement of drivers from Westchester County to Hell's Kitchen to New Jersey. And amidst this growing interconnected network of subways and roadways, a beautiful new commuter train station named for the Pennsylvania Railroad Company was welcoming thousands of more passengers every year who traveled underneath the Hudson to Moynihan's backyard via two state-of-the-art tunnels. Fast forward six decades, 1998. When Moynihan announced what Moynihan called me to his office a few days after I won election to the Senate, uh, having beaten Senator D'Amato, he had helped me a great deal, and he called me into his office and he said, I want to say two things. First, I'm going to let you know, I'm going to announce, now that you're here and you can continue on my legacy, I, want, I am going to announce my retirement in 2000, that I'm not running in 2000. And he said, second, there are two legacies I really hope you will continue. One was helping New York's great teaching hospitals, and the other was transportation. Senator Moynihan knew the importance, the vitalness of infrastructure and transportation uh, to uh, New York and to the country. And I have taken his admonition very seriously every day since, and I've tried to continue in his Big, foot, foot, big footsteps. Now, when you talk about infrastructure, nothing is more important than Gateway, as Tom's presentation so ably showed. Unfortunately, President Trump and his Department of Transportation have th put their thumb on the permitting process, holding up this urgently needed project in a systematic and cynical bid to exert false political leverage over me and my colleagues in the New York and New Jersey delegations. Now, we can't let this stand. This morning, I'm going to discuss what we can do to push Gateway forward in spite of the administration's complete obstruction, which shows no regard for people, for the economy, for just about anything. It's, it's, it's a hard category to climb to the top of, but this is one of the worst things about Donald Trump, that he would do something like this. Okay, let's go over the scale of the problem. The Hudson Tunnels were opened more than a century ago, 1910, two decades before Moynihan was born, and about half as many people lived in New York City. Their old age alone would merit rehabilitation, but as Tom so aptly put it, instead of it expanding capacity, Sandy made us 
need to preserve capacity, and his presentation showed how vital that was. Not only are the tunnels at risk of closing soon, but they're also limiting the capacity on the Northeast Corridor. They're unable to add more trains until new tunnels are built. In other words, the cost of relying on a century-old tunnel underneath the Hudson is twofold. First, the potential of tunnel failure, which experts predict could happen in years, not decades. Tom and the RPA have outlined this. But it bears repeating over and over again because the Northeast Card is the most important economic artery in the country. It's served by eight commuter railroads, four rate right freight lines, 2,000 daily trains, a million travelers, thousands of tons of valuable goods between our cities and ports. And be, if you go from uh, Boston and Maine to Virginia, that's a quarter of the national economy. It's nothing to sneeze at. In other words, the failure of either one of the Hudson Tunnels would throw sand in the gears of a vast economic engine. Everywhere along the Northeast Corridor would be impacted. That means potentially billions and billions of lost dollars, and as Tom outlined, the RPA says it would cost the national economy $4 billion a year, 10.9 million every day, and that's a modest estimate. I've seen estimates that are higher. He was being conservative. Um, and so this is vital. And then there's a second cost, the unrealized economic growth. Businesses choose to locate and expand in the New York City area because they can attract a huge range of workers. We have the best workforce, the most diverse workforce in the country, from janitor to administrative assistant to managing director, who can get to and from work efficiently. If the, that ability to travel is severely limited and employees can't get to work as easily as in other cities, companies are going to start looking elsewhere. So in a brutally competitive national and global economic marketplace, we cannot afford to let the most vital link of our regional transportation network waste away. That's economic suicide. The stakes could not be greater. And yet President Trump and his Department of Transportation have done everything possible to obstruct and delay our progress. Our fortunes took a turn two years ago when the Department of Federal Department of Transportation walked away from the Gateway Development Corporation. As many in this room will remember, I gave a speech a few years ago at the Rudin Center calling for the creation, because this was a passion of mine, and we had too many different groups not coordinated. So I said, let's create the GDC, and let's make the Secretary of Transportation a key member, the others being Tony Kosha, um, well, the head of Amtrak, and Tony has done an amazing job and deserves all of our thanks. I'll talk more about Amtrak later. Um, <clears throat> and the two governors. So that brought the stakeholders together because we needed the active cooperation of all of them to garner funding, engineer and design the project, and eventually build it. GDC was the most effective way to align those goals. Now, some have proposed we move forward on Gateway without Amtrak. That's the other federal representative on GDC. But the notion that Amtrak has been an impediment to progress of the tunnel is misguided, counterproductive, and will only lead to more delay. Amtrak's been perhaps the most stalwart supporter of Gateway. After Governor Christie pulled the plug on the original arc, it was Amtrak that worked closely with me to pick up the pieces and rebrand the effort as Gateway. And more to the point, Amtrak owns, maintains, and operates 90% of the infrastructure covered by Gateway, including the tunnels, so that they've accumulated a very specific and valuable knowledge over the years. They run 450 trains through the tunnels every single weekday. They can't live without these tunnels. That's where their profits are. That's where their passengers are. They know these tunnels as well as anybody. And one more thing, they're essential to the financing. Hundreds of millions of dollars are available to Amtrak annually that can be used for the project. This is an example of bipartisanship pre-Trump. I worked with the Republican head of the Transportation Committee, Congressman Micah from Florida, to say that the profits that, Nor that Amtrak made on the Northeast Corridor, hundreds of millions of dollars, instead of being sprinkled 
to inefficient lines out west, you know, the Cheyenne to Boise Amtrak line, would all be used for capital construction in the Northeast Corridor. That funding, which could be as much as half a billion dollars a year, could fund, because it's an annual revenue stream, $30 billion of bonding. So to cut Amtrak out is dumb, and we shouldn't do it, okay? We all know, and by the way, with Nita Lowy, who's doing a great job, and we're so proud that she's chair of the Appropriations Committee, we have a partner in the House who can make sure we get some of these things done. So Amtrak is far from perfect. Neither is the Port Authority, neither is New Jersey Transit, neither is the MTA, neither of any of us. But we need them to be partners in this. We do. And when I heard the President talk, well, let's kick Amtrak out, and it got some support here in New York, it made no sense to me. None. Okay? Now, um, when DOT left its seat at GDC, it was the first of a series of concerted efforts by the Trump administration to hinder Gateway. Next, they reversed the existing agreement, painstakingly hammered out during the Obama administration with Secretary Fox, Transportation Secretary, to count federal loans towards the local commitment of a 50-50 cost share. I worked hard to get the governors of New York and New Jersey, who originally said this was a federal problem, to say, no, 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 it's a joint problem. And we came to a deal, 50% state, 50% federal. But this really helped the localities to say that the loans could count as part of the state share. And they undid that. Then they fought to block funding by refusing to release appropriated Amtrak funds and slow walking the permitting process. The EIS study for the new tunnels started in July of 2016. And the final materials were submitted a year ago. DOT hasn't even started, didn't even start reviewing those materials till six months later. They promised a record of decision in the first quarter of this year. It's March now, we haven't heard a peep. For an administration that has repeatedly emphasized their intent to improve and streamline environmental review for major infrastructure, it's the height of hypocrisy to sit on the record of decision for Gateway, the most urgent transportation project in the country. And so we're stuck. They're blocking everything. Secretary Chow has been totally uncooperative, and she's getting her orders from the President. I know that. So, in spite of the President's threats to veto funding that includes any resources for Gateway, I've successfully worked with my partners in Congress, Democrats and Republicans, to appropriate billions of dollars to Amtrak and other accounts that benefit Gateway. The last few appropriation cycles, once we got rid of sequestration in the last budget agreement, continued in the present one, with the government open, um, has been very good for us. For, um, the, 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 we've gotten a lot of money there. The appropriation cycles followed a pattern that's familiar to anyone who's followed President Trump's OMB. First, the OMB proposes steep cuts in the budget for all the important agencies and programs. This is Mr. Mulvaney at work. The EPA, public housing, SNAP, food stamps, NSF, you name it, they just cut everything. But those cuts don't survive because of the hard work of those of us in the House and Senate on both sides of the aisle, frankly. Senator uh, Congressman Freelinghuisen, a Republican, who's no longer there but was head of appropes and helped us a great deal and stood up to President Trump. He did a good job. So we undo those cuts. We not only undo them, we get more money. In my role as Democratic leader of the Senate, I've played a significant role in those discussions. And with Senator Moynihan as my witness, I've prioritized Gateway every step of the way. So here's some of the things we got. We got $1.3 billion for Amtrak's uh, Northeast Corridor account. That's record funding. And that's their high, Amtrak's highest priority. We got $5.1 billion for the FTA, Federal Transportation Administration's capital investment grants, including the New Starts program, and we had changed the language so it favors projects like Gateway. $1.5 billion for the FRA grant program that could benefit Gateway. 
including $850 million for CRISI grants and $650 million for good repair grants, and $280 million in additional formula funding, transportation formula funding, for New York and New Jersey, which Senator Moynihan did a good job for us, and we've been able to protect that over the years since he's gone. So there are billions of dollars, this is the bottom line, there are billions of dollars sitting in federal coffers that could be used to benefit Gateway immediately. It's not an effort of coming up with the money we have. It's simply a signature. President Trump and DOT are holding them up. One signal from President Trump, one signature from Secretary Chow, and Gateway could begin. Could begin. Presidencies, thanks to our founding fathers, don't last forever. Even if we somehow dug shovels in the ground today, odds are the tunnels wouldn't be finished before a new administration took office. The sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. We can all agree, and as far as Gateway is concerned, we can all agree there are many things about this administration that are unprecedented, and I'm not gonna, I don't have the time to go into that now. But I'd submit that their stubborn refusal to advance the country's most important infrastructure project qualifies. So, what can we do, what can we start doing to move the project forward, knowing that Gateway will one day be less of a political football thrown about for cynical advantage, as Trump has done, but won't happen under any future administration, in my judgment? And how can we look at where we succeeded, namely the budget and appropriations process, as a mechanism for future action. So I'm proposing a legislative fix to reimburse our local partners. For two years, the Trump administration has denied all federal funding for Gateway under the pretense that the states have no skin in the game. Another one of President Trump's many mistruths, we can call them what they are, lies. The New York and New Jersey that New York and New Jersey need to put real money before the MTA before they'd award grants. But the states have. Let's consider the Portal Bridge vital and the first step in the Gateway Project. Repairing the Hudson Tunnels will mean nothing if we don't fix the problems at Portal. It's an essential part of the project because every train that passes through the tunnels must travel over the bridge, which is just as old has only two tracks, one each way, and comes with its own set of issues. By some estimates, it's the busiest train span in the Western Hemisphere. And yet, due to its low clearance over the Hackensack River, the bridge must frequently, you've probably seen it, swing open. So, um, uh, to allow even the smallest boats to safely pass underneath. It's ridiculous. The most crowded train line in the country, and for a little tiny boat, boom, it has to swing open because there's no other way for those boats to go in and out of parts of the port of New Jersey. But the portal is in such a sorry state that it sometimes fails to close, sending further delays. You're already delayed by the swing bridge, which never should have been happened that way. But then it doesn't work. And there are even worse delays. So everyone's in agreement how vital it is to build a bridge. The environmental permits to build the portal bridge, guess when they were issued? 2008. Doesn't say here. I guess Christie was governor then, right? Yeah, when Governor Christie was there. All the engineering work is finalized. $150 million in Amtrak funds are in place. There. Can't be touched. And New Jersey has fully committed, and this is to Governor Murphy's credit, and the New Jersey legislature's credit, 600 million in economic bond proceeds to the project. That's real local dollars, exactly what this administration has said it wants to see move forward with infrastructure projects, local share. And yet, despite this solid source of local funding and despite a completed EIS, this administration still refuses to move forward with Portal. If the costs of an action weren't so high, this would be an absurd farce. The bottom line is there's just one thing holding this project up. President Trump and Transportation Secretary Chow, who are withholding approval for the New START grant, 
for the other half of the portal funding. The money is there, $771 million. The New Starts program has $2.5 billion. As I said, its formula favors things like this. 2.6 the year before. So the money's there. Congress approved it. President Trump signed that money into law. All that's needed is Secretary Chow's signature. <clears throat> the project's designed. The environmental studies completed. The funding on the local side is earmarked in real dollars. More than enough skin in the game. So, by every reasonable metric, the first part of the Gateway Project, the Portal Bridge, always intended as the first part, should be going. This project should have shovels in the ground, but Secretary Chow won't sign off. That's what we're waiting for. The stalemate is emblematic of the fundamental issue facing Gateway, which is that New York and New Jersey can't even work on the project without approval from the highly politicized and not on the merits on this issue and on so many other DOT. So the administration hides behind this litany of excuses, but what this is about, we all know it. It's punishing elected officials who refuse to fall in line behind President Trump. At the end of the day, the federal government promised half of Gateway's funding to the people of New York and New Jersey, which isn't as much as many other large federal projects. And I'm sure we'll get there eventually. But the stakes are too high, the impending disaster from the damages to the tunnel too real to continue to wait for DOT to do the right thing, to continue to wait till January of 2021 when hopefully there'll be a new administration. So I'm announcing today that if DOT continues to withhold the New Starts grant for Portal and the ROD for the Hudson Tunnels, I will push legislation joined by my colleagues in the New York and New Jersey delegations Senators Menendez, Booker, and Gillibrand, that will allow local partners to advance the federal share for shovel-ready projects today by requiring they be reimbursed once the federal funding grant is in place. And we'll push this to an appropriations bill, the surface transportation reauthorization, or some other must-pass legislation. Right now, if New York and New Jersey raised every dollar they expected to spend on Gateway, they couldn't spend a dime because they would fear they wouldn't be reimbursed by the FTA. Reasonable. Under any normal administration, the states would just go through the new starts and spend their funds when they got the federal money. But this administration has cynically drawn out the process. So our legislation would give the sponsors of nationally significant projects the assurance they need to begin construction with local money only while, this, while still in the New Starts pipeline. They aren't required to advance the federal share, but if this legislation passes, they will have the assurance they'll be reimbursed because Donald Trump won't be president forever. The federal government has an obligation to move pieces of large-scale transportation like Gateway through the pipeline in a reasonable manner, especially when there's a big pot of accessible money and as I said, in normal times, there'd be no need for this legislation. But because of the President Trump's intransigent, stubborn, and reckless obstruction of Gateway, the legislation's necessary. There is no reason why Gateway projects that are shovel-ready should wait for the signature of transportation, the signature of the Secretary of Transportation, when we're racing against a doomsday clock. And so we'll push legislation, that obligates the DOT to uphold their end of the bargain by reimbursing local partners for their federal share of portal and other pieces of gateway that are ready to move forward right now with local funding and approvals in place. Now, of course, I recognize there's, this is not a magic solution that will fix all of our problems overnight, but the time for waiting is over. The crowd in this room represents some of the most influential civic leaders we have on both sides of the Hudson. We should have the power to control our own destiny. So next week, I'll be sitting down with GDC's trustees and stakeholders, along with Senators Menendez, Booker, and Gillibrand, to discuss this legislative fix and how we can work together to move Gateway forward. But in conclusion, as we gather here today, we have to recommit ourselves to seeing this vital project through to the end. It's an investment, it's the most important investment we can make, bar none 
in our economy, unleashing growth that will attract talented workers and business capital from all over the country and all over the globe. It's an investment in resiliency, strengthening our regional infrastructure against the threat of natural disasters and system failures. It's an investment in people, fortifying an essential transportation system that serves tens of millions of travelers along the eastern seaboard. Over the course of Senator Moynihan's life, he witnessed what a strong transportation network could do for his neighborhood and his city. But now, we're faced with the opposite prospect, a transportation system suddenly unraveling and suffocating the vibrancy of New York overnight. We cannot let this happen. I will not let this happen. It's time to get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Schumer and Tom, for the innovative solutions and the call to action on the critical gateway infrastructure. Um, the senator has important business to attend to down in Washington, and so uh, we thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at our next event on March 11th with the Female Deans of Engineering Schools at Google. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.